Good afternoon, America. It is October 23rd, and it is 2.18 on this beautiful Wednesday afternoon coming from Royal Oak, Michigan. Today, we see that uh, President Trump has uh, announced a ceasefire in Syria after withdrawing troops in a rather rapid and, I'd say, unexpected fashion, um, potentially even haphazardly. But um, Turkey and Russia have agreed to a ceasefire to uh, patrol the border and, uh, in theory, to prevent the genocide. Um, You know, we we had a video about this the other day, and I stick to it. What I really would like to see is how uh, oil and gas flowing through the pipelines from Qatar through Saudi Arabia and Syria and through Turkey into Western Europe is involved in this. What exactly is the relationship related to oil and gas? Um, how is is the United States or Russia benefiting from this? What is what exactly is the real rationale from an economic standpoint? I'm guessing we're not going to find out because this is likely going to be hidden behind classified uh, classifications. Um, but nevertheless, you can see that something is changing. Um, and it may be because the president appears to be getting boxed into a corner. Um, This is another, the Ukraine envoy who was appointed by Secretary of State Pompeo uh, came out and said that there was a quid pro quo uh, with President Trump's phone call to the Ukraine uh, president. And um, as a result, looks like the president may be looking at, uh, you know, increasing evidence that shows that his behavior on that phone call was an impeachable offense. Um, Again, my stance on this is that pretty much every time he opened his mouth, he commits an impeachable offense uh, because he repeatedly disavows his oath of office to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. But since the uh, since the Congress wants to adhere to uh, this Ukraine storyline to get him out of office, then uh, that's what we should pay attention to. And it appears that uh, Pompeo may actually choose to stick behind uh, his pick for the Ukraine uh, ambassador as opposed to standing by the president. Uh, And and further evidence of that is that he is looking at running for Senate uh, in the state of Kansas uh, in 2020. Now, uh, Mark Zuckerberg was also on the Hill recently and uh, testifying in front of Congress. And he was talking about a little bit about Libra, although he was trying to say that he does not speak for the Libra organization. In case you're not familiar, Libra is more than just my zodiac sign. Libra is also the cryptocurrency uh, that that uh, is attempting that a, a group of corporations are attempting to put together, and um, you know my my take on this is that it's not to be trusted. I mean, Facebook has broken how many rules already with with violations of personal privacy, and on top of that, now they want to put together uh, they want to put together a consortium of corporations to create a cryptocurrency, and, and again, this cryptocurrency has no connection whatsoever to Mother Nature and and will not solve anything. As a matter of fact, it will solidify the stranglehold that corporate corporate America has over uh, all of us, we the people. And what we need to do is break the bank and establish a central credit union that gives the American people control and uh, an ownership stake in the economy. Now, why is why is this cryptocurrency you know, why is there so much talk about possibly adapting cryptocurrency or or even late, lately there's something called modern, modern monetary theory. Uh, it's called modern monetary theory. And this is something that uh, you know, the, the presume mostly it's coming from the left side of the aisle. Again, you know, I'm not on either side of the aisle. I'm an American and I believe in sound economics. Uh, but modern monetary theory presumes that you can just helicopter money as the Federal Reserve did in 2008. Again, they're not Democrat or Republican. Ben Bernanke is, you know, he was the chairman of the Federal Reserve when he did that. So I don't know what his political leanings are. I believe he's, yeah, I'm not really sure. But anyway, um, this modern monetary theory presumes that that you can spend without taxing and and not uh, expect any kick or any any negative uh, effects of that. And, Nothing is free, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing is free. Everything has a cost. And that reminds me of a conversation that I had yesterday with a gentleman um, here in in, uh, a coffee house in Royal Oak. And 
you know, he, he and I agree that healthcare is a human right. We both agree that everyone should be covered and that we, America and the world would be better off if everyone had our basic needs met. Where we disagree is that he believes that corporations should not have the right to earn a profit by providing a service. And the bottom line is that somebody needs to earn money in order to provide profit motive and incentive to do, to do research unless you want to trust the government to do all the research and be the only proponent of research uh, in advancement of society. Now, as an American, I believe in the free market. I believe in ingenuity of innovation, innovative entrepreneurs. Problem solving at a profit is the best way to move forward as a country. Um, and the market, when properly properly regulated and de with a ba proper balance of regulation and deregulation at the same time, is going to give you the best result. Now, granted, the government is, there is a role for government research and the government deserves credit for um, a number of breakthroughs, inclu including a lot of space research, Velcro, computers. I mean, there's a lot of different things, right? But, um, you know, a, a, a good balance between government funded re research and private sector innovation is the best way forward. And when you have, when you, when you have a group that wants to drop money from the sky um, and wants to give, you know, basically eliminate the profit motive from an entire market, you threaten to destroy, basically you threaten to kill the goose that laid the gate golden egg. And so why is all this happening? Well, the reason why it's happening is because of this. Now, negative yield hits 13 trillion. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, what that means is that we're currently in deflation and we have been since 2014. Now, I, I per personally, I believe that we've been in a deflationary cycle since 2001, uh, but uh, it, it hasn't shown up in terms of negative yielding bonds until 2014 globally. And many people are now starting to talk about negative yields coming to the United States, including, including the president is, is saying that we ought to have negative yields. Now, the issue here is when you have it, the issue here is deflation and why why we have deflation. Deflation have is a normal part of the cycle when when a market operates as it should with alternating periods of inflation and deflation, generally three three years of inflation and growth followed by a year and a half to three years of, of counterbalancing deflation. And that's what happened in the free banking era of the 1800s. Since the central bank took over, we've had boom and bust, boom and bust. And um, and that's not healthy. And in 2014 now, as a result of the boomers retiring at age 65 and withdrawing their assets from the investment market and living on income uh, drawn from that, the, the, the balance of investable assets relative to the interest available for drawing is not, is not even. And, and for that reason, because of the demographic shift and the aging of our population, and their drawing of their assets out of the market, that is the reason why we are seeing deflation. And so because the federal, the central banks are going to fight deflation with, with uh, fancy words uh, like, like quantitative easing, effectively meaning helicopter, you know, helicopter money, they're just basically printing money and injecting money into the system in order to offset the deflation of the money coming out of the system from, from people retiring. That's what's going on. And so if you look at this chart here, you can see what I referenced, um, you know, this is a five wave cycle. You have wave one, two, three, four, five, potentially with a consolidation period right here. This right here is what you have an early breakout and then you have a buy point here. So we're still below a buy point, but what I think is going to happen without any significant change to our economic policies that we're gonna have runaway deflation. And that's where it's gonna break point here. You've got 13 trillion at a peak. At 2016, it came down. We're back up to 13 trillion, and if it passes that, we're likely to see, you know, we're likely to see negative yielding debt well into the 20 to 30 trillion dollar range. And that means that if that happens, we're looking at global deflation, uh, and the banks are going to print money on a massive basis in order to combat the deflation. The American people are going to see positive economic numbers because it's all going to be printed in nominal dollars, but yet we're going to continue to feel like something is wrong, which is what's going on right now. Um, so 
why is this happening? Well, the reason why this is happening is because we don't have any tie to the environment. Okay. And so what we need is a central bank. And again, this is, this is the model for my business model, which I'm now championing for a central credit union. You can use this uh, for the central credit union. It doesn't have to be the actual business. But what we really need to do is open up the marketplace to new investable assets. And so what this could be is, for example, you know, our objective as a people, not as a business, but as a people, should be al to align human society with nature. And if we do that, then we will balance the economy as well as balance our impact on nature. The way to do this is to open up new markets for loans and investments that are aligned with the planet. For example, geothermal heating and cooling. Uh, it, we, that's, you know, these are massive markets, $120 billion is just a start uh, to get off of oil and gas. You're looking at trillions of dollars of market opportunity. And, uh, and that, is, that is opportunity that people can afford to invest into. And, um, and that'll reduce, that'll reduce the, the deflationary cycle that we're in. Um, let me pull up a, so for example, right, um, this is, what I'm proposing is a, is a new dollar issued by a federal central credit union, which all of us as Americans and, you know, eventually people all around the world have an ownership stake in the economy. And the currency will be offered as a cryptocurrency because that is the next evolution of currency. And the, the cryptocurrency, the currency itself, will be invested into both income-producing assets, for example, solar, wind, geothermal, organic farming, sustainable fisheries, et cetera, as well as into conservation and restoration assets so that we can preserve the value of the underlying assets, the natural resources that actually give us life on this planet. If we burn down the Amazon, we're going to lose 20% of the world's oxygen supply. If we poison all of our water, we will have nothing left to drink and we'll, and we'll, and we'll die. Um, these, are, these are facts of life. The laws of nature rule economics as well. And if we don't adjust our economy to fit in with the laws of nature, we're going to be in real trouble. So this is, you know, it could be, it could be Lincoln's greenback. It could be nature coin, whatever the case may be. The bottom line is the objective is to make sure that we're able to pay interest and that we're able to uh, incentivize planet-friendly actions by conserving and restoring natural systems and reducing pollution. If we do this, then we will have more money for more people and the planet will be healthier. We will be have lower stress. Healthcare costs will come down. We'll have better food, better water, and pretty much everybody will be happier, healthier, and much wealthier. Now, to get there, we would replace the central bank with a central credit union. Now, in doing that, we would wipe out our U.S. national debt to a great degree because our external debt is is about three trillion. The most of this debt that we owe here is internal debt to the Federal Reserve and to ourselves through Social Security. Um, you know, go to LibertyStrikesBack.com and take a look at my take a look at the website on that plan. Uh, I show you how we can provide universal health care for all at a much lower price uh, and therefore re remove the Medicare-related debt uh, as well as the payroll tax associated with it, how we can replace the Federal Reserve as the central credit union and strengthen our retirement security and effectively eliminate the Social Security tax and the payroll tax, how we can drastically reduce the cost of defense spending by getting off of oil and switching to renewables and eliminating the majority of the debt that we owe by simply ending the, ending the Fed and replacing it with the central credit union. Um, we, we simply cannot afford to repay the $75 trillion in U.S. total debt uh, when the debt per citizen is at, at $224,000 and the debt per family is at $874,000. That, folks, is slavery, and that is what debt as money will get for you. It's called slavery, and we need the only way to fix that is by ending the Fed and replacing it with a central credit union that is aligned with our money, aligns our money with our values of a healthy, wealthy, clean, green, and free planet. Okay, this is Joe McKee with Liberty Strikes Back, and I look forward to coming back to you tomorrow with more analysis on the news, economics, and, uh, and, and aligning our society with nature.